Thank you, everyone. Uh, Judy Ryerson is going to introduce our program this evening. Uh, Mr. Oliver, if you'd like to come up. Probably everybody in this room knows John already. If, if you haven't seen him mowing the lawn at the, at the bank, or you know, you've heard him or seen him on walks and talks for the LRCT and uh, other places he volunteers. And I had the great fortune of being on a hike he did last year. He led on Red Hills and cellar holes and you know, wonderful old uh, locations of the people who lived up on that mountain. Uh, John's family, as probably everybody knows, uh, lived up on the other mountain, you know, Ossipi Mountain, and their, uh, their life up there has been pretty well chronicled in this publication of the Historical Society, which I think was written by your mother. Yes. yes. Yeah, Martha uh, Paul. Well, a lot of information was through Unistavis. And through Unistavis, who was also a relative. Mm -hmm. right. yes. And, uh, yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, it was a wonderful talk, and at the top of the mountain he started telling us how the old tools were used up there in these meadows that were, you know, growing back, but you could still see they were open meadows at the top of the mountain, well, not the top, in the shoulder there. And I thought this would be a great talk, partly because we have a barn full of tools, some of which we don't know what to use for. And so we thought this would be a great time to do that, and then after he demonstrates a little bit, we can wander back in there. I think we can all fit. We just sort of fan out a little bit and, and look at some of these tools and maybe somebody else has ideas or memories of what they were used for, how they were used. And uh, it, it's just a wonderful opportunity to learn more about the society and more about our own, our own history. So John Oliver, who is the uh, grandson of Lizzie Lee uh, Porter, who was the last person to really live sort of full time up at the Ossipi Mountain Interville. And by the way, it's a wonderful exhibit up at the castle now. Go up the back road, just go in there. <laughs> and it's, it's of it's many of the pictures that are here, but also many of the tools and artifacts and, and, and letters from the Lee family when they lived up there. And it's an absolutely wonderful exhibit. It may not ever be assembled again, so if you have a chance, it time runs out at the end of June, so uh, hurry on up and take a look. Is it at the stable? It, it's at the carriage house. The carriage house. Yeah. Yes, yeah, which are, in fact, the stables. Yeah. But they call them the carriage house. So. But you know where it is, where the, the jazz is and so forth. And the castle is open every day now, but you know, you can uh, drive up the back road. So, thanks, John, and okay. thanks you for doing this. Yeah. And we're looking forward. To it. So, if anybody has any tooth problems, or <laughs> I have a, some tools here that we could. <laughs> I think I'm going to start off by in different seasons, and I'm going to start off with sugar in the spring year. They used to, they didn't have metal too much to speak of to make, make sap bottles. So what they used to do is take an ash tree, a small ash sapling, and that way they could take a hot piece of wire, and they'd get it red hot, and they could burn a hole right through the sound. And then they could take it, they'd take it down at the end, because it'd be, it'd tape it at the end, because that way when you drive it in the, into the, tree, you want to have a, a, enough of it so it builds up for the sap to come back out, out of it, it's like dam it up. <clears throat> um, when they were using the, uh, they'd go, they'd, they'd, they'd bit, drive a bit, they'd, take the bed and it'd go into a tree about three inches. That's about as far as it go. And they use probably about a 760 hole. And uh, it, they would uh, fall in the air if they, they couldn't really tap a tree too close to, to the, about an inch and a half on top and bottom and on the side, you really couldn't use it again. You couldn't tap right next to it. Because it, it would seal up over it, but the sap would go around it. So you'd have to sell over. 
And I know my grandma always said there are certain ways of tapping a tree. <laughs> you know, you see a tree, oh, we just drive a hole in the tree anyway. But she'd always look at the tree and say, okay, if the, if the limbs are all, more limbs on one side than the other. The other, she'd tap under a, a cluster of tree limbs, because that's where the bulk of your sap is going to go. So it wouldn't necessarily be on the southeast side or southwest side, it'd be whatever the... And the older the tree, the thicker the bark would be, it would take longer for it to start running in the morning, but it would run later on in the day, because it would hold the heat in the sun. A young tree that had thinner bark would, uh, would run faster start up quicker in the morning, but it would shut off in the afternoon. And if you had a southwest wind, if you had a southwest wind that came up, it would cut the, it would shut it right off. It would just shut it right off. It would do it. I don't know why it is about southwest wind, but that's what happened. <laughs> and Back then, they used to make their own sap buckets. I think you have sap buckets down back here. It's probably made by somebody here in town. But we have the sap buckets that my great-great-grandfather made right in the kitchen in the, on the mountain. And he'd sit there in the evening and just <coughs> cut out the angles of the wood and slap it together and put a band around it and off you'd have it. Heat it up with hot water in the morning, let it set for a while, and swell it up, and be all set for the season. Uh, they had, uh, she had a cow that she trained when she was on Austin Road. And this cow was used for milking, but she also used it. That's the cow right That's there. That's the cow. And that cow was trained to lay down and stand up, and she never ever put a stick against it or anything. She never whipped it, she never used it, never believed it. But <clears throat> she told me the story that when the men folks were up on the hill somewhere, they were cutting the trees for the firewood. She'd get a colon, be in the winter time, she'd get a colon, hook the cow up to the sleigh. I think there's a picture of the sleigh in there. And she would walk the cow up to where the men folks were cutting the wood. She'd turn the cow around, and the guys would load the wood on, and she'd wrap, strap it down, and she'd come back down to the barn and unhook the wood, turn the cow around, tell the cow to go back up where the guys would cut the wood, and the cow would go up by itself. She wouldn't have to, at that first time, she wouldn't have to do it again. So the cow would go up, where the guys are cutting wood, stop, the men folks would load the wood on, the guys would tell them, load the barn, and the cow would come back and get out of the barn. <laughs> so that was, and she used this cow for sugar and tow. And we had a, a, probably a 20, 20 gallon tub that my great grandfather built. I have that too. And uh, we used to load that up with sap. And, Raised on the sap house. So the cow was used for, for milk and butter and <laughs> transportation for <laughs> um, She also said that when I mean, they were building the barn, they had they built this house, a barn, on the Austrian in 1792. But before that they they would start cutting the lumber and doing all the, getting some material ready. And they used a lot of hemlock for the timbers, for the barn and for the house. Probably a lot of this stuff is hemlock. I wouldn't be surprised. Because it was very strong. Once it dried, it's just like iron. You couldn't drive a nail to it. But what they'd do, they'd take, the, take this auger and they would, make the holes for the pits, and they would use oak pits, red oak or white oak, whatever. They used to, they liked white oak because that was really strong. And they, they would get everything up green, they put all the timbers up green, everything was up green, 
and then they'd peg everything. Because once once you draw it, it'd be very hard to even couldn't do anything with it. And when you put it up green, it won't twist on you. If you let if you put it out here and try to dry it, the hem off it just twist right off. So they they made every they made everything for the house. My grand my grandfather would set during the day in the in the, in the evening. I don't know how many hours they put in. <laughs> my grandmother said they used to be up at four in the morning and they would go out and do the chores, come in, and they certainly didn't have conflicts and bananas. That's what she did. <laughs> they had eggs, bacon, ham. <coughs> potatoes, everything for breakfast. But she said sometimes in the evening my, my grandfather would sit down to the <coughs> in the kitchen. And if they needed a chair, he'd, he'd start whittling out and cutting out with a yeah. cutting out a chair and, and put he put a chair together in the in, in an evening. He'd put it together. And then the women folks during the day they would they would take brown ash, not the white ash, but brown ash and pound it. And it just lodge the grain and they could slice it so they could get all the weaving for the for the for the chair. And this little instrument right here, my she said my grandfather used to cut out the shingles. Just he just slice them right up. And he'd get that he'd get that tapered, you know that really tapered in. He'd get it perfect every time. And they'd do a lot of pot, they had pot. Yeah. And then they would right here, I'm not exactly sure what it is. Boy, this would really get a tooth out of you. <laughs> but we won't use it. This is a uh, hatchet, but you notice there's a groove in here that you use that to pull the nails out of it. But they use this a lot when they were shingling, shingling the house and stuff because they could slice it and cut it and, and then if they had the little square nails they used to have, they could use it to pull that up. That's the same thing and I'm not going to open that up because it's the same as this and I thought it was pretty dangerous. It's like a double jackknife. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is, some, this is really some of the old bits that the, uh, the dentist just used. No. <laughs> Can you imagine using stuff like that? I guess it would. Here we come to a side. Now, the side was used a lot back then because they didn't have the power equipment. And my grandmother said that they used to go out with maybe two or three, four men in the field. And she said sometimes they'd start right in the middle of the field. And one guy would start making his circle. And then the next guy would come, once the circle got big enough, he'd step in behind the second guy and he'd come around. And they would take a probably a six or seven foot swath. Good swath. And she said a good sized one could could cut that hay, wheat, oats, whatever they were cutting, and he could drop it right in the window. There would be nothing over here. Once he came across to that, it'd be setting right in the window. And that, these, these sides are a little bit shorter than what they used to use. They used to be a little bit longer. My, actually, my grandmother taught me how to use these. <laughs> I mean, they just didn't work in the kitchen. They were out sometimes have to do men, men folks work. But uh, I can remember working with, uh, does anybody remember Tom Cooney that used to be the road agent? I used to work when I was in high school, mowing bushes along the side of the road. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So you're a guy. Yeah. <laughs> and... I can remember a man named Fred Martin, probably some of you folks remember him. He used to work for the state highway. He was a highway patrolman. 
there would be like three men mowing on one side of the road, and he'd be on the other side, and they still couldn't keep up with him. Even though he stopped every once in a while to roll a cigarette, smoke it, he wouldn't, he wouldn't smoke it while he was working. He'd smoke it, and then once he was gone, he'd continue mowing. And those guys kept right on trying to catch up with him, and they couldn't. But he could shop on the side, so sharp, it'd be just razor sharp all the time. He'd never have to work hard with it. He could just look at the button. And this is a, this is really not this is a, a, a knife stone, but a whetstone is maybe a little bit longer than that. But they could they could they could go back and forth like that and they could raise this razor sharp all the time. Keep it nice. But Herb said that they could mow, a man with a good side could mow maybe an acre and a half to two acres a day. And that's pretty good. <laughs> but down where Mark Richter has his uh, small engine repair shop, that used to be a, a, a pasture in there, and there used to be nothing but rocks. Mm -hmm. And I can remember Herb lived in the house up on the hill right there. And he used to mow that all by hand, and it'd be just like a mowed lawn, mm -hmm. just perfect. But he would, he would know how to use that. The rakes, I'm gonna, can we go out? I'm gonna, they had, they called them a bull rake. Has anybody ever heard of a bull rake? Mm -hmm. The old fashioned with a curved handle. Some of those rakes were actually made down at Mobile Falls. Up in back where my mother's house is, there was a cellar hole right there. And they used to use the water power from that little stream that's in back of our house. They'd run the little augers and the bits and stuff to make the holes for the, for the pins. And they had their uh, uh, router that they would route out this stuff. And a lot of those bull rakes were actually made right here in Mobile. Mobile Falls, and in Mobile Falls we had we had a saw mill, we had a grist mill, and the grist mill. Once the grist mill was in operation, my great parents would, would come down with corn and whatever they had to dry, and then have it made into meal. And then when they went back to the mountain, before they started up the mountain with the horses, my great grandfather would take and put a hundred pound bag over his shoulder and he'd walk up the mountain with it because he didn't want to wear out the horses. <laughs> but then, then there was a, uh, a uh, the rig factory. There was a harness shop, there was a blacksmith shop, and I believe that there was a, um, a grist mill. I guess that was it. That was all down at Mobile Falls. Which, which is exactly where? Sheridan Road. But down with the Sheridan Road? Right there. Where it yeah. The sawmill, the sawmill was on this side of the bridge. The grist mill was on the opposite side, but on the lower side, right next to the road. And then the uh, the rake factory was on Sheridan Road, but behind my mother's house. And then the the, um, the blacksmith shop was just up the road, on the right hand side on the corner. The the harness shop was down almost opposite the Sheridan Road, on the left hand side. There was a lot of stuff there, a lot of industry. A lot, of the, a lot of the rakes I think that we have here were actually probably made on um, right Mobile. I got uh, oh yeah. He's got one here. My grandmother used to make these. He's not mine, but he used to make these all the time. To take ash, green ash, slice it out, round and round, one, and then let it set. And once it dried, it stayed perfect, mm -hmm. good and solid. And what were they? Hmm? What were? They? Well, sometimes she used to put a, a little screen around the bottom, mm -hmm. and they used it for sifting. Mm -hmm. 
And then sometimes they use them that have like a, a solid bottom to them and you use them like just a container and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those cheese Yes, oh yeah. yeah. This is not that old. No. The earlier ones often had a piece of rope instead of a metal yeah. yeah. and a yeah. rope up with, but the design hasn't changed. And, and I think there was my grandma, I think she has one now, with just a, a single handle, but a big saw with big teeth on it. And they used to use that to cut up the cardboard. And Grammy said that, you know, an average guy with an axe could cut maybe a cord and a half to two cord a day. That's a four foot long, four feet high, eight feet long. Um, and he could cut that in a day, two cup of cord a day. cut out an axe handle or something, they wouldn't, just, the axe handles you get now are so big and bulky that heavy and, and they, they're nothing, they're solid. Grammy said that uh, a good axe handle would, would actually, when, once you got the head on it, you could, you could move it like that and it would just bend, bend, yeah. Because if you're cutting wood all day long, you don't want that vibration, that solid handle is going to vibrate like crazy. But uh, a, a, a handle that can give, you won't be getting that, that vibration in your, in your arms all the time. And they used to have, they used to make some, some of the handles they'd make out of horn beam, American horn beam, or they'd make them out of white oak. But they'd have a very, a very thin handle. I, I'm, I wish I could have brought one in the other day. I had one, and I think it's something we lost me up in the castle. But it's very thin, not very thin, hand, very thin. There's a half made one out of mine. Huh? There's a half made one okay. out of mine. Yeah. And they, you know what they used to use? They used to use glass, a piece of broken glass to, to scrape the, and shave it down. And shave it down with the glass. They use a double bitted axe? Double They may have, but I don't. I, I never heard anybody mention a double bitted. You know, it's not. Because yeah. that, that one where you showed the, the puller, the nail puller, the other end is, could be a hammer, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's it's a definitely. Shingle. Oh, yeah, that's a shingle axe. That's a shingle? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I got I got a little story on this. Okay. From my grandmother. Okay. I spent a lot of time with my grandmother. My mother worked most of the time. One day at the uh, on Sheridan Road, I was playing under the maple tree with my toys and stuff. And my grandmother was sitting in the chair enjoying the shade and sunny day. And these city people came in and he looked the road in the car and they stopped and they said, Excuse me, ma'am, could you tell us where this road goes? Well, my grandmother got up with a cane and she walked over and she said, Well, she thought for a minute, she said, Well, you know, gee, I came down in 1913 up down here. The road was here then. And she says, You know, I don't recall this road going anywhere, do I? <laughs> well, they thought for a few minutes and they thought, oh boy, we're up against this lady. <laughs> I don't think they really realized who they were up against. But anyway. They said, well, all right, as long as this road's been here, if we continue on to this road, 
Where will we end up? Well, she says, you know, we'll probably end up at the end of the road. <laughs> well, this time the lady was getting a little frustrated with her husband because she just wanted to get out of there. And then he, he, he insisted on going that one extra step. He said, well, if I continue on the road, I do end up at the end of the road, where do I end up? Well, she said, if you're not careful, you'll end up in Squam Way. <laughs> <laughs> but my grandmother was like that. She was a very cool woman. And she would, uh, she would take me, I'd get home from school, and, and she'd have my play clothes all out for me. And she had a little knapsack, and she'd say, well, okay, there's a hill, go for it, go up there. I used to take off, go up on the hill, go up in the woods, poke around, see what I could see. Every, every when I came back, every time, she'd sit down with me and say, okay, now, how far, how far did you go? What did you see? Where did you see it? And that was, that, that was the routine for me, every night. Rain or shine. That was my playground. She, but she, she knew where, how far I would probably go. Cause she always said, "Go, with, go the distance that you feel secure, that you know how to get back." And she'd never tell me how to get back. She'd just say, "You know, go, you, you learn how to come back." That's how it happened. <laughs> That's how it went. But she was, she was a good lady, very strong. She had a cane. You ever heard the story of line in the sand? Mm -hmm. Well, that cane, I still have that cane today that she used, and even when she was a young woman on the Osprey, she always carried a cane with her. Well, I guess B. F. Shaw and my grandmother and my mother, great grandmother, had a face to face encounter. And my grandmother took this cane and she drew across the ground and she said, you don't come across this property. This is it. We're not coming any closer. When we get the price that we want, then we'll leave. But we're not until then. That's, that's, that's when he really got upset with her and decided to put that uh, ungodly fence up. Now wait a minute, this is Tom Plant. Yeah, Tom Plant. You said B.F. Oh, I'm sorry. We Tom like B.F. Yes, B.F. Shaw's husband. Tom Plant. So once the fence is put up, and that's not a, that's a spike fence, yeah. a spike. I don't know, if, has anybody been up to the city castle? No. Since it's been up, since, since the little replicas? My son David and I put a very ugly looking fence out in the field. <laughs> Nobody's going to say, what in God's name is that thing? But that's what the fence would look like, but only 20 times longer. It was probably, I don't know, Maybe 100 feet, 200 feet long. He, she, he put it up to, so the folks could see the lake on the side. But that's a, that's my little story. So I don't. Know, but, but I could, we could look at some stuff out back. Yeah. Yeah. John. Yeah. Well, I mean, where'd you get the box to keep all your tools in? Oh, that was my grandfather's. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Probably made it, right? Made it. Yeah. And this is an old ranch. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's an old, old. <laughs> Probably didn't have that one. <laughs> I don't think there's too many pipes that they had to do. Little box. Oh, that's, that's, that's my little, that's the little box with all the little gadgets. Besides 
that one that you have? Yeah. <laughs> the crown. The crown. Got a really big one. Uh, the, we could. Well, we may have to take it out if it's that big. Let me just roll on there. All kinds of little. These were not made in Japan or China. I guarantee you. <laughs> But they weren't made in one world either. No. And then if you need something chiseled, we got this here. Good stuff, too. Good steel. This is for small filling. <laughs> New Britain, Connecticut, or Millers Falls, Massachusetts. Yeah. That's where most of that stuff is made. So we take a walk? Yeah. We can't uh, miss an opportunity to see these this our newest acquisition or loan. Yeah. From uh, Josh Bartlett. <laughs> well, it's it's not uh, it's it's actually from my wife and her brother. Uh, the kind of a newest little collection, and we figured that this is where it belonged. Uh, Fred Davis lived in this town all his life. Uh, actually lived in the building that, that is now Zellix. Uh, and then lived down on Route 25. But in the 1920s, Fred was born in 1915. In the late 1920s, actually more in the early 1930s and through the 30s. Uh, Fred, like a lot of people in this town, uh, did what they needed to do to make a living. And uh, Fred trapped and hunted and was uh, kind of a uh, handyman. But one of the things, uh, John mentioned that it was very seasonal, uh, maple sugaring, <coughs> But even before that, <clears throat> in the late winter or real early spring, a real good crop that was, that was available for somebody that was willing to work hard was ice. Now before refrigeration, uh, before mechanical refrigeration, ice was a, was a very good crop. And uh, the men in town would put together crews and they usually used either Garland Pond or Kanasatka because they were both closer to the road. Uh, and there was a, it would be a crew that went out and cut ice off the pond. Generally they wanted the ice about eight inches thick. And they'd use a horse-drawn plow, which we were pretty sure there was one here, but we, hadn't, we weren't able to find it. But there was a horse-drawn plow that they used to cut grooves in the ice. They cut them about as deep as they could, about four inches, and cut lines. And then there would be a sawyer who would take a saw like this and cut the ice the rest of the way. And the idea was to cut it in blocks about 18, 16 or 18 inches wide, eight inches thick, and about 30 or 32 inches long. They weighed about 125 pounds, which was about as much as they expected to be able to handle. After they cut them, they chip them out with a chisel. This was probably made here in Moultonboro. It's handmade, and uh, uh, Wakefield, well, Wakefield, whose blacksmith shop still exists. It's down the little building on the right-hand side just before you get to the dump. Yeah, it's Across from Ottenberg. Yeah, Ottenberg, I think, owns it now, but yeah. that was uh, his blacksmith shop, and this thing is hand-forged, the handle is. And this is kind of cool in that it has a couple of company names on it, but I don't know whether they were the company that made it or he repaired it or what the story is. But it has pointed shoulders on it, so along with cutting the ice, you could also corral a block and pull it in with it.
when you got it close enough, they'd have a gin pole set up, basically a two pair of uh, bipod legs with a derrick arrangement on top of it. They'd have a very big pair of ice tongs. <laughs> Grab the block. This would be tied to the bottom end of that gin pole. That gin pole might be 20 feet long and the people end of it would be 12 or 15 feet. So there'd be a rope tied to the end of it. So they could lift the block out of the water and then rotate this whole pole derrick boom over and let the ice block of ice down on the sled. If they needed to handle the ice, those big blocks, this is a short ice PV, which you can use to catch the block of ice and set it up on end or roll it over and generally just push it around with it. The blocks were then taken to ice houses and there were a bunch of them here in town. I'm sure John knows where there's a bunch of them. And they, yeah, well, Laconia Ice Company was huge. But uh, where Bob Wallace lives, there was a little ice house there between the barn and the, and the house. Basically, they, they were double walled. They filled the space between the walls with sawdust, which, of course, the ants liked real well, so they didn't last very long. But then the blocks of ice would be put into these ice houses and packed in sawdust. If they were shipping them, to Boston, which they did, put them on a wagon, take it over to Meredith, put it in a rail car, and take it to Boston for the, for the restaurants down there, but also up here. They'd also cut the blocks into sizable blocks, 25-pound blocks, and the small blocks, which were about 8 inches cubed, you could handle with a pair of tongs like that. These are also good for picking up small children. <laughs> or cats. And cats, getting their attention. But uh, uh, John's told some stories. I got one quick story about the about Fred Davis. At least the the uh, story I heard was that this was a real good way to make a good amount of cash if you were willing to work hard. They were paid on piecework, and Fred told me that his rate as a sawyer was three cents a block. And there, the story is that on one, at least one occasion, he made nine dollars in one day. Wow. That's 300 blocks of ice <laughs> in an 11-hour day, which is about all the daylight they had. And he probably was the highest-paid man in Moultonboro at the time, because <laughs> nine, nine bucks a day in 1935 was probably a whole bunch of money. Not that you could keep that rate up very long. I think I can remember Herb Martin saying that he used to get 25 cents or 50 cents a quart. Oh, yeah. Yeah, make a half a buck. Yeah. Work your tail off and, and make a half a dollar. <laughs> but the whole, uh, the whole ice harvesting thing only lasted for about six weeks, if they were lucky, maybe four. And uh, they kind of made hay when the sun shined. But these tools are on... These tools are on loan from uh, Fred's daughter, my wife, and her brother, and uh, yeah. we hope that they help with the with the museum. Norm did a great job. They're on the the, the, the story is on the website, and uh, as are the pictures. We don't have a lot of cookies to eat before the end of the evening, so we also got a couple of bull rakes up here. Yeah, yeah well, we should just take a quick tour around, and anybody who's got some information. Yeah, I think so. Which is why we from. Yeah. Yeah. Although they got a big face. Oh, yeah. Granny would have a hole about that long. Oh, yeah. Well, and also, there are enough boxes, I think.
about anything, right? Oh, yeah. You yeah. could get corn, uh, uh, beans, beans or... Oh, I see. Or, uh, My grandma would take uh, baked beans and she'd pick them in the fall and then she'd hang them up upside down in the barn until they all got dry. And then she'd take this little handle, or another little handle of wood that's rawhide and she'd flip it and get them. Yeah. And it all, yeah. all come out and then she'd take a shovel and just... Put it in one of these things and, and it took all the husk and all the oh yeah the bad stuff, stuff up and then the beans would shuttle down into a, a bucket that she had it. somehow there's a bucket thank you I would think so. Or some hot sauce or something. Yeah, they had to find something for everybody else. But I can remember, I remember Tom Cooney. Yeah. He was road agent. Yeah. Dave Thompson, I would come yeah. into his kitchen with, with Gladys. And we'd sit and have dinner. And he'd always have this big glass of, I thought it was just water. I didn't think it was. It was clear the bell. And Gladys says, you and Dave want some a drink? Something, right. And Dave says, yeah, I guess. So she, she'd go and she'd call Dave Gladys. I mean, he didn't know what it was. Oh, my God. We didn't know if we were in back of a dump truck or what. Then, but in the afternoon. We used to hand sand all the roads. Oh, yeah. And here, yeah. in the back of that dump truck, and we'd, have, we'd be so, we'd be like, oh, what did he give us, you know? But it was, it was hot sand. What are you talking about? Off to right, and there used to be a side of it. I used to make cider. Yeah, and I can remember my my grandmother and my uncle picking apples and putting them in a four or five boxes, and we take them down there and we get a couple gallons of cider. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, there's somebody here giving a little lecture on the Poor horse. I know. I